Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 307 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength conditioning information, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. Check them out at performbetter.com. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Renna. The show notes are located at my site, continuefit.com, where you can find out all about my stuff. All right, today on the strengthcoach.com and the NBSC TV Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about his article on specialty bars and for the most part why he doesn't like them. Uh, some different hiring practices, that he has uh, kind of adapted over the years and professionalism inside the gym. For the Nomly Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach segment, I got his partner in the Certified Functional Strength Coach segment, Kevin Carr. Kevin is the co-founder of both Movement as Medicine and the CSFC. And he has a new book out called Functional Training Anatomy. So we spoke all about overcoming weaknesses as a strength coach and really how he kind of advanced at MBSC, building your own brand under the shadow of a mentor or big facility, his definition of functional training, what it means to have a comprehensive training program, all about his book with, uh, we go over two different examples, like they have a great format in the book, we'll talk about that, and really what he learned from doing the book. All right, so Anomaly is the member experience platform for modern training gyms. It helps you build lasting relationships with your members so they can stay longer and pay longer. It's an incredible tool. It really puts all of your communication with your members in one place. And this allows you to keep track of that communication, which, by the way, is so important for retention. We hear so much about marketing but rarely about retention. This is the tool that will help you build lasting relationships with your members. Go to nomly.com, that's N-A-A-M-L-Y.com. You can schedule a demo to get a feel for what you can do with this incredible tool. Use the referral code STRENGTHCOACH to get started on your free 30-day trial. All right, for the Train Heroic Data-Driven Coaching segment, Tim and Adam discuss Instagram marketing specifics. So last time they were talking about basic pillars of online marketing with social media. And now they go, they dig a little deeper with Instagram. Don't forget, Coach Boy and I both use Train Heroic to deliver all of our online training. They have plans that start as low as $10 a month, depending on how many people you have. And they have a free 14-day trial. Mention that I sent you. You'll get a four-week athlete development program into your account absolutely free. If you're a coach looking for the best online training solution in the game, and if you're not in it, you got to get in it yesterday, go to trainheroic.com. Take the free 14-day trial. For the Certified Functional Strength Coach segment with Brendan Rarick and Kevin Carr, give him Kevin uh, the day off. Let Brendan take over. He's going to continue the series called Learn to Coach. It's all the variables needed to become an amazing coach. So in part two, Brendan discusses, uh, he's going to dive into the movement assessment and the assessment workout. For the Fit to Speak segment, Jenny talks about the power of telling stories, how to structure information into a story format, and how you can use stories to influence and motivate people that you interact with. All right, lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with... Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the strengthcoach.com and the mbsc.tv Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Today is brought to you by MBSC TV. Just relaunched. Looks very pretty. MBSC TV is the secret weapon that top performing strength and conditioning coaches use every day. Get a front row seat, all access passed. What makes Mike Boyle's gym number one in America, as rated by Men's Health Magazine. Uh, Guys, if you if you're especially now, if you don't have a huge staff and let's say you're not doing staff meetings, I personally think the staff meetings are worth the price uh, alone for admission. And uh, 
Um, it kind of goes over what all of us, I mean, you'll see some housekeeping stuff in there too. So I think it's, it's a good thing for any, especially any small gym owner to, uh, to be part of. So, uh, they got a seven day trial. You can check out a couple of them, a couple different videos They're posting more and more content. Like they say, it's the Netflix of strength and conditioning. So check it out at mbsc.tv. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing great. And how are you doing great? Doing great. Uh, you know, I, that is, we're talking, we're going to get to some Twitter issues. It's, it's amazing the, 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 the interaction on Twitter with some ridiculous topics, but specialty bars, you just posted this today. And, and I do, I, not that I have a problem with you, but, um, I think you and I have talked about this a lot in terms of your lens. Sometimes you don't, in my opinion, you, you know, it's always good to listen to Mike Boyle, but understand where he's coming from. If you have a, 3,000 square foot gym, maybe you're not going to, you know, think about what Mike's talking about here with your gym, as opposed to his, Mike, what do you got? 23,000 square feet now. I mean, it's, I just don't um, think it's yeah, the same. 3,000 in Woburn and, uh, and more, you know, and another yeah. 7,000. So, yeah. yeah. So you, you know, you were talking about, somebody asked, you know, there's a forum thread and you kind of posted a little bit of an article. Um, you're not a big fan because of the business based on volume, but you know, cause you don't have enough for everyone, but you do have a few exceptions. So just kind of touch on this and what are your exceptions? Well, yeah, you know, it's interesting. And that's why I tried to, to hopefully explain that in the sense of seeing it through my lens, because that's exactly the way I'm looking at it. I mean, having one of something really doesn't do us any good at all, except, and that was what I said in the article, except in situations where that one bar allows us to say, you know, work around an injury or do an exercise in a way that is going to be beneficial for a specific person. And so like we do have a, a safety squat bar in each facility and, um, you know, but we don't. I would say we don't use them extensively. You know, we use them if somebody breaks their hand. We don't use them for split squats the way some people would use hand assisted split squats, things like that. And, um, you know, the same way with Swiss bars or some people call them football bars. But, uh, you know, in, in those situations, we keep one. So if we do have somebody with a shoulder problem or a wrist problem or whatever it is, we can get that neutral grip bench press for that person. Whereas something else like trap bars, we went out and bought, you know, we've got uh, 14 trap bars because the way our station's set up, we've got six racks in our Middleton facility and we've got eight racks in our Woburn facility. So basically, you know, when we're thinking about lifting pod style, we've got to be able to have that piece of equipment in every pod to be able to do the exercises that we want to do. I think the trap bar merits buying for everybody to be able to do that. I think the other ones really become kind of specialty items for somebody who's hurt, you know, you have one, but you don't, you don't attempt to program those things in. Absolutely. And yeah, I, I mean, I'm a fan of the article because you also do say, it. you know, look, it's based on a business, uh, you know, we run a, a business based on volume. So there is, but you do like some of these bars. So people should take that into account. And I do like the way you use them to say, Hey, you know what? You can't do this. Go over into the, you know, go grab the, uh, the other bar for, for this, you know, just for this one and not that many people are going to be using it. So it is okay. So, uh, good stuff on that. Um, yeah. could you, you know, if you've got, if you, if you're doing one-on-one -on -one training or, you know, you've got some trainers for you and you're, you're, you've got primary one-on-one -on -one facility, you know, maybe some of those little like gadgety gimmicky, gimmicky things are going to be fun to play with. But uh, in our situation, we we have to look at it very, very differently. We've got to look and think, do we want to invest in this product? Absolutely. Um, and yeah, like even like, a, uh, you know, if you have if you have a, a place where there's only three or four pods, it's a different story. Uh, it's not as big of a deal. It's not that much of an investment. But yeah, you always have to look at your programming. So, Coach, we got Kevin Carr on on the episode today uh, talking about his new book, Functional Training Anatomy. And you wrote the forward. It actually didn't, uh, um, uh, you know, make it to the first copy. And, uh, I got cut. Yeah, you got cut. Um, and Kevin, so Kevin had posted it. But you know, what? 
One of the things that I, I really thought was interesting, and I want you to kind of give a heads up to the gym owners out there, somebody who's looking to hire. Um, Kevin was an intern, and Nicole Rodriguez came to you, and she was like, Mike, you know, we got to bring him back next summer as an employee, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, look, he's kind of quiet. And, you know, you didn't notice him first, uh, you know, that much that summer. But she continued to rave about him. You know, she said, look, he's going to be really good. Talk to us about the importance of, you know, your team in this process and in, in maybe taking a look at some things like, well, I got a quiet guy, but I used to have car was quiet in the beginning too. What, what, what did you learn from really from, from that, that hiring from Kevin? And what are some things that like gym owners should look out for when they're hiring? Um, I think it, it's, I think one of the things you should look at is especially when you've got younger coaches, you know, someone like him, he came in and he did his internship. Um, I think after his first internship was after his sophomore year, he was one of those kids who really knew what he wanted. I'm going to Mike Boyles. I'm going to be an intern. And um, he probably wasn't that confident. He didn't really, you know, he wasn't, I mean, he wasn't anywhere near the Kevin Carr that we have right now. Let's put it that way. But it makes you realize one, trust your staff. And I'm actually doing a business talk and I'm going to write that note down because you know, I've done that like, you know, when Ken Whittier was there and now Steve Bigelow and those guys, they really do the hiring. You know, Pat Stefanski, who's running the internship program, those guys, um, they, they do the hiring because one, and I said this the other day to somebody, um, people say all the time, you know, sometimes I might be, oh, I really like so-and-so and they'll say, yeah, he's great when you're around. And, and that's a really bad sign whenever anybody says that. <laughs> Because, you know, some people are smart. They know, hey, you know, Mike's here. Mike's on the floor today. Mike's, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to bring my best self to this uh, thing. But then Mike leaves and suddenly we're not getting that anymore. Whereas, like I said, Ken and Steve or Pat or whoever it is, you know, Nicole at that point in time, they see somebody's work ethic day in and day out, group in and group out. And I think that's a big problem in business. You know, there's a ton of people in business who hire you know, kind of career suck ups, you know, guys who are just good at managing up and they're good at getting somebody to think that they're good at their job when they're really not. So it's a really good lesson. I think in any business setting to ask, you know, I guess the senior coworker, what their opinion is of that person as a future employee or as, you know, someone to get promoted or whatever it is, because you get, I mean, you just get invaluable information. Yeah, it's it's obviously as many eyes as possible and as much feedback as possible in those different situations. Obviously, is always a good thing. Cool. So let's let's kind of stay on this business type idea. Maybe you're gonna write another note down. Um, I, this was the Twitter thread that I thought was I, I just I couldn't believe um it got this much attention. And um you wrote, I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but males training without shirts in the weight room just screams unprofessional to me. Uh, you know, this is obviously your opinion. You, you said that, um, you have a thousand likes. I'm not sure if you ever had a thousand likes or 65 comments. You certainly had a lot of comments on some of your controversial posts, but talk to me about this and, and, you know, a little bit hypocritical, you know, here's Mike Boyle walking in, doesn't shave, does, you know, has his flip flops on a little casual, probably has a, coffee with maybe some, you know, Irish whiskey in there. What, what talk to us about that? Um, yeah, I said it came out of a, a post that I saw of a, literally a high school kid doing a clean max and they're all in there with the, no shirts on. And one kid has the kid who's cleaning actually does not have sneakers on. He's in his socks doing a, a clean in their weight room. And I just thought this is so unprofessional. And as you said, some people might point at me and be like hypocrite. And somebody did, somebody made a wisecrack about I feel that way about people coaching in flip-flops. And I was like, oh, got me on that one. But um, I think the difference, and I, it, it sounds so hypocritical, but I'm in a different situation. I'm the boss. And so I can dress the way that I want, and I can act the way that I want. And effectively, uh, you know, that's up to me. It's my prerogative at this stage of my life. But um, – I just think there are certain, I guess, minimal standards of professionalism. I'm not asking somebody, you know, to to put a polo on and khaki pants and wear a belt. You know what I mean? But I mean, yeah. you know, you keep your shirt on, make the kids that are working out keep their shirts on. 
it, you know, it, that's not really that that tough. And it was very interesting. One, it was interesting because a lot of people felt the same way. Obviously, a thousand likes. That's mo I, I don't even know because I've never really tracked my Twitter likes, but I'm sure that was far and away the highest. And not too many negative comments. I think that people who felt differently about it were not very willing to come out in this particular situation because I think you have to look at that and be like, hmm, maybe it is a little unprofessional and maybe I shouldn't let the kids do it because it's amazing. You know, some of the responses that people said, oh, you know, young ego driven males, you know, that's what they like to do. And I'm like, there's a lot of things young ego driven males like to do, you know, that we probably shouldn't let them do. And we definitely shouldn't let them do under our watch. So I don't think that that's a really valid uh, example. And then, you know, someone else said, well, oh, if it's just guys in the weight room, why not? And I said, you know, half jokingly, well, what if the weight room was just girls and all the girls decided to take their shirts off? You know, I mean, literally the, everybody would freak out. Like, what are they doing? Right. You know, even girls, you know, you wouldn't let your women's sports teams in general work out just in sports bras, you know, so it, it is an incredible double standard, but we have, and this uh, Danny gave him a laugh when he listens to this podcast. But I had this fight with Danny Gableman because uh, I let the women wear tank tops and I don't let the men. And he told me one time, he said, that is so sexist. That is so wrong. And I said, you know something, Dan, you're right. I said, and as soon as you have Dan Gableman strength and conditioning, you can make all the women wear sleeves. I said, <laughs> I'm not doing it that way. <laughs> and it was like, that was the end of the conversation because in the, I guess the difference is in psychology, I want to empower young females. I want our young females to come in and look at themselves in the mirror and be giving me a double bicep in the mirror. Like, look at me, I'm jacked. I do not want that from my young males because it's really, I mean, there is a double standard in everything and in strength and conditioning and in female body image. I mean, the one thing I don't have to worry about is sort of the, uh, you know, the self-esteem of my young athletes on the male side. <laughs> if anything, I got, you know, I got to worry about, it. I should take all the mirrors out because they're constantly looking at themselves in the mirror. And if I let them have tank tops on, they'd spend that much more time looking at themselves in the mirror. Whereas, you know, girls, there's almost like a body shaming effect of, you know, you're not supposed to have muscles. You're not supposed to, you know, be looking at yourself in the mirror kind of thing. So it is a, it is a, a Mike Boyle strength and conditioning, 100% endorsed double standard. Yeah. And I think, um, even you had another post earlier in the week about, Look, we don't allow headphones, earpods, tank tops and cutoffs, sports bras, T-shirts with obscenity or alcohol references, music with racist or obscene language, gloves, cultures both created and tolerated. And then at some point, someone had said, hey, look, I don't have a problem if there's all men in there. And a young lady had said, why would women being in the room make a difference? Um, you know, yeah, like you, you said double standard. So that makes males not want females present so they can act a certain way. And then it, she said it basically gets them used to the argument uh, not to hire, you know, female coaches for male athletes. She's heard the argument from a club before. Boys can't be boys when a woman is around in the gym. So there's a lot of layers to this. And even on that thread, you had, a, you know, this was almost like a precursor to that. Did the uh, shirtless thread. You had a lot of people kind of, what? No cut, no gloves? Why no gloves? Or no cutoffs? You know, um, but a lot of people obviously agree with a lot of those policies. Yeah, you know, it, it's really interesting to me. Um, how I, I, I want to use the word ignorant and that that'll probably piss some people off, but how ignorant some male coaches can be when they say the things that they say. And, and sometimes I think, well, one, maybe they've never worked in a coeducational environment. I'm not sure. I started off at Boston university in a coeducational environment in the, in the eighties training male and female teams. And you know, it wasn't a situation of, oh, when the guys are in here, we're going to do this. So you, you got to have one set of rules, you know, about behavior, like big things like shirt on, shirt off, you know, that kind of stuff. You got to have rules. And, and I mean, I was lucky in the sense that I could create my own environment with my own double standard rules and people live with it. And I, you know, I almost laugh in the sense that I'm really surprised there hasn't been more pushback on it because the day after I posted this, a guy, a new adult guy showed up with a tank top on. Uh, this was uh, <laughs> Wednesday of this. And Kevin Carr immediately went in the, uh, 
storage closet and got him a T-shirt. I would say the one way to get a free MBSC T-shirt is to show up with a tank top on because uh, most of the time we'll give you a free T-shirt when we ask you to cover up. And it really is somebody else says, you know, what's the big deal? And my problem with the big deal is I watched the college football players literally cut, you know, a guy, like guys would cut their shirts to the point where like, what's the least amount of shirt I can have that they'll allow me in the weight room in. That's what I found after a while. Do you know what I mean? Like when you said, well, cut off sleeves are okay. You know what I mean? And then next thing you knew you had like kind of you know, spaghetti strap tank tops with no armpits in them, you know, you know what I mean? It was like, <laughs> it just got ridiculous. And it's like, okay, I'm done with this. You know, break, come in with a, you know, come in with a great t-shirt, come in with a short with sleeve, shirt with sleeves and we'll get to work. Uh, yeah. And I think it's worked for us because I do think we've created a really positive culture. We've created a culture where males and females are really comfortable training together. And at the same time, and you're not, you know, in this sort of segregated, oh, this is, you know, uh, this is the guy's hour or however they do it. And the ones who get away with that, because football gets football only weight rooms. So they can get away with that. In basketball now, they're getting some schools that have basketball only weight rooms. So they get away with that. Um, somebody else said, oh, you should never, don't work with track. You know, you would hate elite level track. And I'm like, I wouldn't hate elite level track. I'd just tell them. When they came in to lift, they had to have a t-shirt on. <laughs> you know what I mean? It would be like, hey. And this is the funny part about it is sometimes people look at this thing, you know, why do the athletes get to make the rules? In in our environment, the athletes don't make the rules. And we just tell people, you don't like it, go someplace else. Yeah. And in a college situation, it, it, you know, it never comes down to that, right? Hey, here's the rules. Follow them. That's yeah. the great thing. You know, college, you know, college is is a lot like prison in that regard, in terms of you know, these, these people don't have a lot of, uh, they don't have a lot of rights. They don't have a lot of ability to, to, to argue and fight with you about anything. So they, they do what you tell them to do. It's a little bit tougher. Uh, obviously I remember like when I was with the Red Sox, there was some guys who wore gloves and I was like, okay, I'm probably not going to be able, I'm not going to win the glove thing. These guys have, you know, been lifting with their batting gloves on for how many years. So I sucked it up and I let guys wear batting gloves when they lifted. I didn't like it, but guy, you know, I wasn't going to, that wasn't where I was ready to kind of, uh, you know, plant my staff or whatever. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't going to, to fight about that item when yeah. I had other things that I needed to fight about. Yeah. You got to choose your battles out, you know, in, in the pros, that wouldn't be one of them. Um, yeah. and you know, coach, like, you know, you look, let's be honest, you work with a boatload of women who are still, uh, you know, come to train with you whenever they can, whether that's soccer players from that won gold medals and hockey players and, and uh, lacrosse players, et cetera, et cetera, that over the years, the women that you have had great relationships with and who had a, uh, just a great time or an amazing experience in MBSC. So there, there's got to be something uh, to that with those well, policies. There, I think there's there's definitely something to it. I think it, it's one of the reasons it's funny. I had a, I won't say the person's name, but I had a conversation years ago with um, another entrepreneur like me who was running a private strength and conditioning facility. And he was um, very much, uh, he was really surprised that we were 50% female. And this was a long time ago. This might've been 15, 20 years ago. We were still 15 or 50% female. We were half and half guys and girls in a private business. And he said, wow, I can't get any women in here. And I, I remember saying to him, look at your staff. You know, he had a bunch of muscle head guys, you know, tank tops, tight black shirts. I said, this is not a female friendly environment. And I think we've created a really good female friendly environment where people want to come in and want to train and they feel like it, they feel like equals. They don't feel intimidated. And I mean, it, this is, it's a great business thing because, hey, you know, half your athletes, half your potential clients from an athlete standpoint are female. So you want to create a situation where those people feel comfortable. Absolutely. Coach, if you're my age or above, you know, maybe you used to have this on the list. Remember those, <laughs> those, those like bodybuilding, like those long, really wide, loose pants they used to wear, like with their tank tops. You remember those? Zubaz. Is that Zubaz what that is? Pants. 
<laughs> yeah. Was that ever on the list? Or uh, we're showing our age, oh, but yeah, but yeah, you could not. I've always been a believer. Like I don't want uh, the same thing. I never let <laughs> athletes train in pants. And you know, luckily we don't. I mean, I, it's been a long time since someone came. I mean, I guess somebody could train in sweatpants if they wanted to, but um, you know, no, like clown pants like that, not happening. You know, the, <laughs> the MC Hammer, the MC Hammer look. Yes. <laughs> oh God. Anyway. <laughs> I'll leave you on that note. Mike, thanks for doing this, and we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, bud. All right, guys. We're still not back really to live presentations, but there is a solution. The Perform Better app is live, so you don't have to miss out on education. And it features amazing presentations from last year's virtual summer seminar series, as well as some top presentations from the earlier functional training Summits include some of the world's best trainers, coaches, and therapists, all for free. Check it out at the App Store or the Google Play. Don't forget, too, they're also now doing a weekly webinar series. Lots of education. Charlie Weingroff was last week. This week, March 9th, Lee Burton will do program design considerations for improving musculoskeletal health. There's upcoming webinars from Josh Hankin and Jessica Bento, Ali Gilbert, Emily Splickle, Gray Cook, Dan John, and Vince Gabriel. Guys, check them out at performbetter.com. Welcome to the Certified Functional Strength Coach segment on the Strength Coach Podcast. My name is Brendan Rarick, and today we're going to continue our Learn to Coach series where we discuss all of the variables that go into becoming a great strength coach and personal trainer. We'll cover everything from communication to progressions and regressions and exercise selection. Last week, Coach Kevin Carr discussed how to have your very first conversation with a new client. Today, in part two of the Learn to Coach series, I'm going to dive into the movement assessment and assessment workout. At Certified Functional Strength Coach, we find the systematic approach of the functional movement screen, also known as the FMS, to be the most useful tool for our screening patterns before layering on strength and speed. The FMS tells us if the joints are able to get into the necessary positions to optimally perform the action. If they can't, we intervene with a corrective exercise and retest the screen to see if it improved. In coaching terms, our good friend and CFSC coach Drew Massey said it best. The FMS tells you when to put your foot on the gas and when to put your foot on the brake. Don't use the functional movement screen or you're unfamiliar with it? No problem. Any movement assessment of your choosing can work here. What's important is that you're assessing and not guessing. This process will lead to better exercise selection based on the individual's current abilities and not exercise selection based on what you think they can do, what they tell you they can do, what they want to be able to do, or what they used to be able to do. We want to meet the client where they're at, then progress them safely to where they want to be. After our initial movement assessment using the FMS, we take them through our assessment workout. If you use the same first workout consistently, then every exercise can be a screen. We keep this first workout incredibly simple and scalable. What does this initial workout include? The warm up, about 10 minutes. We begin with a full body foam rolling circuit starting at the calves and ending at the thoracic spine. Here we can see how the client gets up and down off the ground, how comfortable they are getting into each position, and we also get a snapshot of their tissue quality based on how they verbally respond to the pressure of the roller. If the ground is too cumbersome, we can foam roll standing against the wall. Next, we do a Spider-Man stretch and a lateral hip rock stretch to see how their hips move in all directions, flexion, extension, rotation, and abduction. If they should need a regression, we can move them to a table and do the hip stretches there instead. Next, we perform a set of supported leg lowers, 
a set of single leg bridges and a set of floor slides. This allows us to assess hip separation, glute activation, hip flexion, thoracic extension, and shoulder flexion in three very simple low risk drills. Regressions would be to add more support, move to a two leg bridge, or use rollers to elevate the hands in the floor slide. If these or any drills during the initial workout are determined to be too easy, then we progress these exercises in the second workout. No need to progress and shoot for the moon during the first session. Now that we have addressed the hip and shoulder, we want to look at movement at the ankle. We do this by doing a set of standing ankle rocks for each ankle reaching the knee for the wall. We finish the warm up with the lunge matrix. This includes a toe touch to squat, a split squat, a lateral squat, a rotational squat, and a single leg reach. Here we get to see how the hips, ankles, shoulders, and core integrate to produce movement. The strength circuit 20 minutes. Exercise number one push ups to a yoga block. The yoga block helps gauge depth. If the push ups on the ground are too difficult, Elevate the hands to a bench or a bar. Exercise number two, body weight split squats. If the exercise is too difficult, use a dowel, a bench, or straps for support. Exercise number three, front plank. The goal is to be able to hold a front plank for up to 60 seconds. If they can't, ask them to hold the plank as long as they can and then record the time. Cut the set at 60 seconds if the front plank is too easy and progress to a more difficult anti-extension exercise in their second workout. Exercise number four, body weight reaching single leg deadlift. If the exercise is too difficult, use a dowel, a chair, or straps for support. Exercise number five, strap rows. The further you walk your feet down, the more difficult it will be. I have never had anyone not able to do some version of a strap row in their first workout unless their arm was in a sling. You will then perform the strength circuit for a second round. Conditioning, three to five minutes, one mile bike ride. We ask the client to ride at a pace they are comfortable with. The great thing about the bike is that it's very low impact. Again, we are not here to break any records today. It's to get the client comfortable with you, the environment, the pace, and the exercises. Do take note of their average RPMs and the time it took them to complete the ride. Any fitness tests, such as a max aerobic speed test or a shuttle run, can be done in the next workout. Again, we select drills that are low risk, easy to scale, and simple to do. Your first conversation and initial assessment will take 20 to 30 minutes. The first workout assessment is meant to take 30 to 35 minutes for a total of a 60 minute session. You can observe a lot just by watching Yogi Berra. Thanks for listening to this episode's. Learn to Coach series presented by Certified Functional Strength Coach. To learn more about the Functional Movement screen, head to functionalmovement.com. To print out this assessment workout, head on over to the blog at certifiedfsc.com and download the PDF. Thanks for listening. Hey, this is Adam. This is Tim. Welcome to the Train Hook Data Driven Coaching segment. Oh, yeah, baby. We're going to continue our uh, little foray into marketing here. But I think it's uh, it, it will bear some fruit to dig into Instagram specifically. Like we, we, talk, yeah. we talk about social media, but in a lot of cases, we're really mostly talking about Facebook or Instagram. Uh, and Instagram has some, some things to, to know about it specifically. So, Tim, give us some numbers here. Yeah. So, 
I think the numbers are kind of staggering. If you think about this, and this data is within, you know, the last, the last couple of years here, 250 million people per day view Instagram stories. And I, on average, those folks spend 24 to 32 minutes scrolling through those things and absorbing content on Instagram, 250 million, right? That's That's stories pretty- specifically, you, you said. Yeah, stories specifically. So people are watching those stories that go across the top of your Instagram screen from bubble to bubble, and people are just consuming that content for, Adam, what seems like a long time. That's a lot <laughs> I mean, of content. And yeah, then yeah. there are going to be people like me. And to be honest, I almost never look at people's stories. Yeah. And then if, if, you, if you think about stories, it's kind of that video format. Um, I got this statistic from HubSpot. By 2021, that's this year, folks, 82% of all uh, consumer IP traffic will be uh, headed towards video, right? Like that's four times the amount of consumers who would, would prefer to watch, I don't know, a product video or, you know, an animated GIF over just reading your text, your, your text stuff. So keep that in your mind when you're building out your content on Instagram, right? And the other thing is you don't have to, don't think about it as, oh, my brand, I don't have this huge brand. I don't have a, a beautiful website. 76% of folks would actually prefer to hear, you know, some, some content shared by what I consider for more of an average Joe, maybe a lower cost style video or something like that, opposed mm-hmm. to on a huge brand page or a huge Instagram account that's linked directly to a brand. Yeah, so those are a couple cool. staggering numbers there to kind of kick this combo off. Sure. That goes back to the authenticity, I think that we, we mentioned, which is, um, you know, you may not be able to influence a lot of people if you're essentially a small brand, but you might feel more real to people, to the people who do see you. Um, yeah, yeah. So we just established there are a lot of people on Instagram, duh. Spending but, a lot of time in there, yeah. <laughs> but the amount of time, the amount of content that people do consume is, is pretty high. So, you know, I'm actually, I'm not a social media guru, to be honest. Like, like I just said, I don't look at Instagram stories. I, I, consume, yeah. I consume other content on Instagram sometimes. Why don't we go into that a little bit? Like what kind of con- right. different kind of content is there and who does it reach and, you know, how well, Tim? Yeah, so let me connect the dots for, for everyone here. So I'm going to break, for right now, I'm going to break Instagram down into two, two primary categories. You have what we call, what we consider grid posts. That's like standard, old school. I'm going to post a picture on Instagram. It's going to show up next to my other pictures. If you're looking at, a, at an Instagram page kind of on the bottom. That's a grid post. That is going to be a tool or a mechanism you can use to grow your following, right? You can by having good captions, by using great hashtags, by creating conversation and getting people to save and share those things, which we talked about last time, you're going to grow your audience, your total audience. Now your, your stories are going to be what's keeping people who are already following you engaged and keeping them following your journey. And if you do, you can utilize some hashtags in there to, to see, you know, some new folks or get new, new eyes on your, on, on your account, but generally those are people who are already following you. So it's less about, you know, which one engages better. It's more about who, what is my goal here? Do I want to engage my current followers with stories? Do I want to lead them, you know, through a sales funnel, get them to click a CTA, purchase a product, get a freemium, something like that. Or is it something where I want to put a ton of value out into the world in the grid post where now folks who are maybe in the fitness industry are looking for training. They see some hashtags. They can identify with that post I put out there and now they click follow and now that gives them the opportunity to save and share that content along the way there's some other things in there Adam like reels and things like that which is more long form videos um some some numbers are still coming out about that but those are the two main things I'd focus on when you're when you when you're kickstarting a an Instagram page for your for your brand for your coaching for your product grid posts grab and bring people in uh your stories are going to really lock in those folks who are following you already and again saves and shares is what you're after there so is it that you know is it that way because you know the the stories maybe take slightly longer to consume like because like for example like you know i look at a lot of grid posts actually that's what i see yeah Um, when you're scrolling through that's what you're seeing right grid posts so but i i don't consume a lot of stories so yeah you're saying that people who are already attached to you are more likely to be really invested in seeing those stories versus People who are, may not know about you, you can you can grab their attention with like a quicker kind of quicker bite, essentially. Yeah, exactly. And, and you're right. Video content, like we just mentioned in those numbers at the beginning, you know, that's going to be a huge way people you know communicate moving forward. It already is. Um, but those stories, 
do take a little bit more time to produce just because you actually have to film and edit, maybe do some editing. Again, I wouldn't recommend taking that editing way out of bat, you know, way, uh, be, spend a lot of time on it. People kind of like that one-to-one average Joe kind of look. Um, and another tip there, Adam, is if you create those things, save them on your phone, save them on your device. Don't just uh, load them up to, to Instagram. You can use those things forever. Cool. That's going to do it for us today. Go to trainhook.com, start your 14-day free trial. We've got low pricing in there to suit any kind of coach. Welcome to the Fit to Speak segment. My name is Jenny Rerick, and today we're going to talk about stories. Stories hold more power than any other form of communication. They allow us to capture the emotion of the people we're communicating with. And as humans, emotion precedes logic. No matter how rational and sound your information is, if there's an emotional disconnect, meaning something just doesn't feel right for the person receiving your information, that sound logic won't matter. As the novelist Richard Power said, the best arguments in the world won't change a single person's mind. The only thing that can do that is a good story. Stories come in many forms. The stories you tell can be personal stories. You can tell a story of one of your existing clients or athletes. You can tell a story about someone or something that's unfamiliar, or you can tell a fictional story. To tap into the power of story, it's important that you understand how stories are structured. When you know how a story is structured, you'll be able to more easily craft information into a narrative format and move people in the direction that you want. Maybe that's to get a hesitant client to commit to a regular training schedule, to help your athlete understand the importance of eating nutritious foods, or to convert more prospective clients into paying clients. How are stories structured? All stories have a beginning, middle, and an end. Some are just longer than others, but they all follow the same structure, beginning, middle, and end. Let's talk about each part in a bit more detail. The beginning of a story is used to grab attention and paint a picture of a current reality. In it, you talk about who the main character is or characters are, and then you provide details about the situation or challenge that they face. If you're going to tell a story, the background should provide enough detail for your listener or your reader to see how it's immediately relevant to them. Before you transition out of the beginning and into the middle of your story, you want to foreshadow the hurdles they might face or where the story might end. When you hint at the challenges or the ending, you expose a gap between where things are and where they might be. Your listener or reader is interested in hearing about how that character or those characters will overcome the hurdles. That's where the tension of a story begins. Then you move into the middle of the story. In the middle, you more clearly define the hurdles faced and how the character or characters overcame those hurdles. It's simply what happens. And finally, the end. The end is a detailed picture of what life is like after overcoming the hurdles. The end might describe how the character or characters felt or behaved as a result of overcoming the hurdles, or it might be a lesson learned. The end is the payoff. It makes your listener or reader think about what this story has to do with their own life. They can see themselves in the story. What can you do with this framework? Use it. Start writing down stories. Stories that you can tell to your clients, athletes, stories you can use at your staff meetings or in your presentations. If you're working with a client who wants to lose weight and you yourself have gone through a weight loss journey, share your story with your client using this framework. That might sound like, here's what my life looked like and how I felt when I realized I needed and wanted to lose weight. On my way there, Here are the hurdles I faced and how I overcame them. This is what my life looks like now and how I feel now that I've lost the weight. Beginning, middle, end. Or maybe you're working with a youth athlete as they rehab an injury. They're defeated and you want to help them stay motivated. 
Maybe you tell them the story about Alex Smith, the quarterback from the Washington football team. Stories are all around you. You hear other people tell stories. You're living a story right now. And you read stories. Stories don't have to be your own. Go out looking for them. And when you find one you like, use it. Or keep a notebook of stories or have a folder on your desktop that houses stories you like but haven't found a place for yet. My challenge to you, think about a current client or athlete you have that's struggling in some way. They're facing a challenge. Find a story you can tell them, one that shows them they're not alone and that there is a way through. That's what I have for you today. If you liked what you heard and you want access to a PDF that details what you just listened to, visit the fit to speak website, www.fit hyphen to hyphen speak.com. I also offer one-on-one coaching. If you're looking for help building and designing a presentation, crafting a story or a message, maybe you'd like to improve your speaking or presentation skills, or you're planning for an important professional conversation, email me directly at fit to speak at gmail.com. All right, now it's time for the Nomly Hit the Gym with the Strength Code segment brought to you by Nomly, the ultimate retention tool designed specifically for fitness coaches and gyms to help your members stay longer and pay longer. Go to Nomly.com, that's N-A-A-M-L-Y.com. Schedule a demo. You want to see what, you know, what they can do. What they'll, they'll show you. When you can see it, it's so much better. And then use the referral code Strength Coach to get started on your free 30-day trial. All right, today I have on no stranger to the podcast, Kevin Carr. He is a strength and conditioning coach and massage therapist. And well, either way, his main goal is to help people move better and become more resilient so that they can excel at the activities they love. Now, you probably know he's been working on Mike Boyle strength and conditioning, but that's since 2008. Doesn't feel that long. It's just crazy how time flies. But uh, they work with everybody there. It's amazing. I and mean, when people say we work with U.S. Olympians to the average shows, they really do at MBSC. So you get a really great feel for all kinds of people. And so he's also the co-founder of the Certified Functional Strength Coach Certification. And obviously, he does the Certified Functional Strength Coach segment with Brendan Rerick on this show. Uh, He also founded Movement as Medicine Massage and Movement Therapy Clinic, which is inside Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning. And he's basically been traveling all over the world, educating thousands of coaches and therapists about the MBSC coaching system. And he has a new book, Functional Training Anatomy. And uh, I think this is the ultimate tool or marriage tip. If you write a book and you can get your wife on the cover you will probably score a lot of points. So, Kev, thanks for doing this. That was uh, that was a vital piece that I got her on there. So, yeah, that, I won big points with that one. So, yeah, thanks for having me. In. And it's amazing because you got like the, it's like the animated cartoon version. So she can't say like, oh, my skin or my hair because, you know, like and then it would be your fault. So. Exactly. She was happy with the eyebrows. She said they said the artist did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> See, I did not pick up on that. So there you go. Kev, before we go into the book, and you know, you were in my book, Be Like the Best, and we 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 have talked about some of this stuff, but you know, I wanna now I for people just so people know, I have a limited edition functional training anatomy because they Human Kinetics kind of, uh, they forgot to put in the forward by Mike Boyle. It's a really nice forward. And Kevin actually posted it on his Instagram. And I talked to Mike today about that, about the lesson Mike took away from possibly not hiring you, Kev. And, you know, he said you were kind of quiet. And and that's not a, a, a bad thing always, but it was just something that it didn't make you stand out. Also, Mike's not obviously always there, but Nicole, who was working, Nicole Rodriguez, who was working with you every day, saw your potential. But what I want to talk to you about is, you know, for a lot of coaches out there, young coaches, obviously, um, how did you kind of overcome that? Or you feel you got out of your shell? Or what was the process there in the very beginning that you feel was instrumental 
in you becoming kind of who you are? I think it was really, you know, intentional practice and then taking feedback and trying to, to build off it. Like I remember the conversation with Nicole Rodriguez when she was doing our feedback meeting and we went into what was Bob's office at the old building then. And she said, the number one thing I have to tell you for feedback is you're too quiet. You need to get your coaching voice. You need to learn to project. You need to learn to speak up um, because I would think I was like an attentive coach, but I, I didn't have a coaching voice. I wasn't confident to project myself. So I remember writing down, I had a little notebook. I remember they told us to keep this a little notebook in our pocket so we could write notes on coaching cues and progressions and things like that. And I remember writing like be louder in there and trying to learn how to project my voice so people could hear me and that uh, I could run a group effectively when it's like loud in the gym and you know, intentionally taking that feedback and trying to build off it. And then throughout the day, whenever like an older coach, like a senior coach like Nicole or Jamie or Anthony or any of those uh, people were working and they would say, hey, you should do this instead. Or when you're coaching this coach like this, I would write a little note in my notebook. Hey, uh, you know, uh, this is the cue you uh, chest up or uh, push the knees out, whatever the cues were at the time. And I would go back and I'd review them. So it was like intentional practice. Um, at that kind of very formative stage when I didn't really know anything. And now I think back and I'm like, a lot of the things I do now are things I learned then. And so being open to feedback and being being willing to actively try to work on those things, I think laid a very good foundation for me so I could accelerate quickly um, and then actually be a formidable hire someone that they wanted to pay uh, to work at the gym. It's such a great point. I mean, and, and it's so I know like me personally, uh, I might sulk a little here and that might be like, damn, I thought I had this right. And I'm doing a great job coaching or in my, in my own head, right? Not, not, I probably wouldn't say that to her, but I just love that, you know, you were able to say, yeah, okay, I'm going to take this and do what they say. And, and I think it's a hard thing because a lot of people, and this is what I think we really learned from Nick Winkleman over all the years on, on the show. And for me, when I spent time with him at Athletes Performance at their men mentorship before they were exos. Um, and that was, you don't want to just be loud to be loud. You wanted, like you talked about, there's these certain cues and, and Nick would always teach about, even if they're doing it right. Like when you, when you comment, you don't want to just say, Hey, Kev, great job. You want to say, great job, Kev. Back is flat. Knees are coming out, butts getting down, right? You want to want to talk about some of those things. So it's really interesting because it doesn't, it's not really just, Hey, Kev, be louder. Yeah, and I remember, it's funny, I can almost think to all the different coaches that were at MBSC when I was like an intern and a first year back hire, and how I took different things from each of them. Like, you know, Nicole Rodriguez's ability to demo and control a group and inject energy into a group. And like you said, being able to connect with an athlete about a certain cue, I remember getting that from her. And like um, Kyle Holland, I remember, was, did a really good job making groups fun and having kids enjoy it and be able to joke around. I remember taking that from him and then people like Jamie Rodriguez, you know, injecting competition. I remember like writing notes and like learning those coaching interactions from each of them. I always think like I took a little piece from each, but it's because I intentionally tried to notice the things that they did and wrote them down so I could put them into my own practice. Cause you're really kind of like an amalgamation of all these people you learn from over time. Um, and and yeah, that's kind of how you learn that art of how to cue and how to communicate and how to coach most effectively. Love it. I think you should come up with like a coaching rules book or something like that. Uh, if only, did, if only someone has thought of that, that I, did a he, great idea. Did he steal most of your stuff? Brandon Merrick? Yeah. I mean, we, yeah, this is, uh, I said, this is our book. That's what, uh, Mike and, uh, Mike and I and Brendan say, these are our books uh collectively uh, <laughs> yeah i love it uh kev let's let's stay on this topic again before we get into the book because i i just i think one of the hardest things to do and and obviously i'm kind of i was kind of in that same boat as well um and, and i think a lot of coaches are not just under a guy like mike boyle which is even harder but when you're at like an equinox or or a planet fitness even or whatever you know sports performance place you are at and you're underneath these mentors and now you'd like to go out and get you know your own voice build your own brand how do you feel like you were able to kind of 
still stay connected with Mike, still have uh, this great relationship and be part of him and be partners with Mike Well Strength Conditioning and, and come up with Certified Functional Strength Coach Program. But but still have this because people know you and they know who you are. It's not just like you're not just a Boyle guy. How how do you feel like you broke out of that that piece under the shadow of Mike Boyle? Yeah, I think I mean especially in this day and age with social media and your ability to build a brand even while you're under someone else's roof, whether it's me at Mike Boyle strength and conditioning or you said like maybe someone at a bigger chain gym like an Equinox, being confident in that you can maybe relay a similar message that's going to be different because it's authentic to you and being confident in, in sharing your unique view on something, right? Like, again, none of the things that are probably in my book are very um, unique to me in that, like, I didn't invent the rear foot elevated foot squat, but probably the way I might have written the chapters or my uh, unique experiences might, you know, result in what my message is. And I think if you're consistently putting out a message that's authentic to you, um, even if you know, you're underneath the shadow of a larger brand or a, a larger coach who, who's helped mentor you, you can still craft your own message that's unique to you and build an audience that way. And I think if you're doing it in a way that supports that larger brand, it's only going to help grow you more. Like obviously having the audience of being um, at MBSC and being under Mike ha has allowed me to have a much larger platform probably to start with to reach a lot of people, but then being able to then share my unique views and experiences, maybe from uh, my background in massage therapy and rehab, I can kind of look in that angle um, or my unique view as like a younger coach uh, being, you know, you know, 20 something years younger than Mike, almost 30 years younger than Mike, I can reach a different uh, demographic um, and message them that way. So I think you have to be willing to be confident to share your views um, and not be intimidated by the fact that, oh, I'm, I'm being overshadowed uh, underneath this larger brand because there are going to be people that pick up on your message still and you can utilize that platform to to promote yourself. Yeah, and I think an important point here to remember is you guys really, at Movement is Medicine, uh, you really helped Mike. The, it was the other way around now because Mike, Mike had, let's say Mike had 10,000 followers. At one point, you guys had about 25 or 30,000 followers on Instagram. And Mike was like, Jesus, what's going on? And you guys were like, Mike, you got to do more videos. And as soon as he started to kind of connect to people with those videos, he just shot up. He has over 100,000 followers now. Um, so it's funny how it kind of works both ways, too. You guys really did help him from that perspective. Yeah, you got to get the old guy onto the new technology, you know? Uh, so I remember him saying, I said, how did you grow this? And I said, we're just trying to post videos of what we're doing um, multiple times a week. And then for him, it's just, you know, he started sitting in the cow chair or doing the car videos kind of with his reflections. And, and there's such a big platform out there um, that he wasn't reaching at the time. And now it's, it's exploded for him. He's kind of, he shot way up. So, you know, it, you can, you can learn in both directions and I'm glad I mean, for our overall brand that he's been able to tap on a social media audience because it's it's helped all of us kind of uh, improve our reach uh, throughout the industry. Absolutely. Kev, let's let's talk about uh, start to get into the book a little bit. But before we do that, I want to kind of get into now this idea about functional training. You guys are the certified functional strength coach and Mike is one of the, you know, not really the grandfather of functional training, maybe that would be a Vern Gambetta uh, or maybe a couple other guys, but Mike's up there as well with increasing the popularity, especially because his book in the early 2000s was functional training for sports. How would you define it? Such a people get it's, it's I don't want to say it's controversial topic like functional training because there was a time in the mid 2000s, like 2006, 7, 8, whatever, 9, people just kind of had this association with everybody was on a BOSU ball or a stability ball or they were doing some kind of balance work. Talk to us about this idea about functional training and what your definition of it is. Yeah, functional training is a buzzword, right? And, you know, you say that word and there's probably a group of strength coaches out there that the first thing they think is someone doing circus tricks on a stability ball and 
having bands wrapped around them. And to me, that's not functional in the true definition of the word at all. To me, functional training means it's purposeful. It means there's a thought process behind why you select the exercises to help that client get to whatever their intended outcome is. It means we're purpose, purposefully selecting exercises to get a client to their outcome and to get them there safely. And to me, that comes down to what their client's outcome is. And the majority of clients that you work with have a pretty general outcome, whether they're athletes or their comp- uh, general population. They want to feel better. They want to move better. And they want to excel at whatever those activities are. And so, um, you know, when you look at the book, and you go through either Mike's book or my book, you'll see the exercise selection. The things that we choose for our athletes are very similar to the things that we choose for our gen pop clients because they're working with the same body. While we might vary intensity or volume, our exercise selection is pretty, pretty similar. And, you know, what, what's functional for, you know, a power lifter is squat, bench, and deadlift. And that's why they might, you know, poo-poo the idea of functional training. But that doesn't mean that that's functional for you know, the 78 year old client that I just trained right before I talked to you or the Olympic athlete that I saw earlier this morning, um, because it's probably less carry over to their sport and it probably doesn't lend itself to them getting to where they need to go safely and effectively. Um, so I just think functional training really means it's purposeful and it's thoughtful. It's not just throwing, um, a bunch of exercises up on a board for the workout of the day. Um, just because you think those things are cool. It means that there's some thought behind the program design process. Absolutely. And I, I think we we have these general terms and then people have their own ideas, right? Like you said, some people would roll their eyes, some people would kind of get a better picture of that. But when you say functional training is comprehensive training, it right now saying something like that almost is like saying, um, you know, train muscle, train movement, not muscles, where sometimes people are like, well, yeah, we know that already, but whatever. Explain, expand on what does comprehensive training mean to you then? To me, it means like the idea of like, this is a recipe, not a menu. Functional training means the whole process. It doesn't just mean you're doing single leg squats, or it doesn't just mean you're doing anti-core training. It means that you're doing movement prep and mobility work. It means that you're doing a active warm up. It means that you're doing power work. It means that you're doing heavy implement power. It means that you're doing strength training, push, pull, legs, core. And then it means that you're doing conditioning. It means the whole product to me. Um, not just the pieces that you like or not just specific things that, that, you know, when people say functional training, they say, Oh, functional training, single leg training. It means the whole process. Cause I don't think you can just take a piece out and get your client to where they need to go. I think you need to deliver them that entire comprehensive package when they come in to see you. Um, and that's why that, that idea of it's a recipe, not a menu. You can't just pick what you want. It's the whole process is really what gets them to the outcome that we want. Um, and, and that's really what's so important when it comes to program design. Yeah, it's so interesting because uh, like there was that time when people thought it was like circus tricks and now it's people just think, oh, well, it's it's single leg training, right? Or it, it yeah, uh, it's exactly. funny how that changed. So it's getting people to kind of understand that, um, you know, it, we have to look at the entire package as, as part of training. So like we had a talk with our staff the other day about like the importance of spending time in movement prep and not letting clients come in late and like, skip the active mobility work and how like the adults will try to just warm up and then go lift. And to me, that's missing a huge piece of the puzzle for especially the gen pop clients, the 30, the 40, the 50, the 60 year old who comes to see us. Um, that's just important for many of them as them going and doing split squats or them going and doing pushups. And so getting them to understand that that's the ultimate product, not just, um, not just the strength training portion. Absolutely. For me personally, with my gen pop, I, I always thought of, and even my, even my golfers who were, I still consider gen pop because they were older, but what I always did was say, okay, on day one, I might've had a, a, a single leg knee dominant with a double leg hip hinge, not paired, but you know, somewhere in the workout and then switch it for the day two, for example. So it might be the single leg hip hinge on day two with a double leg, um, uh, bilateral, um, a, uh, 
you know, knee dominant, like a squat, a goblet squat, et cetera. So for me, I was always kind of thinking of, yeah, I want one arm. That, that's what comprehensive means to me. I want one arm and I want two arm. And I look at it from, from the, the, the week long perspective. Okay. If they're, if they're working out two or they're working out three times, then I could obviously throw more things in there, but there's some, as Brandon would say, some boxes that I want to check off on that. <laughs> Kev, let's talk about another issue with kind of the functional training and you touch on this a little bit in the book kind of give everybody a little bit of a definition in the book and that's planes of motion in the human body and and i think you know part of and we had bobby Straub on uh Shroop on for uh with mike talking about gary gray's system and how they were both you know had some kind of influence on it and and i certainly have had they've in that uh, gary's influence in my program was there because of todd wright i did a mentorship with todd wright down in austin and so i started doing a lot of things in uh not specifically to the gary gray method but Making sure I did a warm up, like a 3D warm up, like forward lunge, side lunge, rotational lunge, forward squat, uh, a split squat, side squat, lateral squat, and a rotational squat, for example. And then even in my my uh, my locomotion, trying to get some kind of a transverse plane piece in there, a, a sagittal plane, and um, uh. What's the other plane? Why am I? I didn't read the book. See a frontal plane. Frontal plane. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jesus. Um, and so, same thing with plyometrics. Like I always tried to get, I try to get all three planes of motion in there when I can, especially you know with a rotational athlete. I make sure that they're going to do those things. Talk to us how we have to kind of walk that fine line with this idea of functional training. If it's not, if we're not going in three three planes of motion all the time, it's not functional. Where do you kind of draw the line? Well, so if you go back and you think about like how strength and conditioning coaches, like how we've evolved, like this all started, like the influence of the weight room started with bodybuilding and powerlifting, right? And those are going to be very highly focused on sagittal plane activity, right? Um, for powerlifting, bench squat, deadlift, you know, where they're trying to create as much force in the sagittal plane in those three lifts as possible. Lots of force generation, very little variability in movement in plane, uh, planar action. And then with bodybuilding, when, if you're trying to maximize hypertrophy, then again, you want less variability in planar movement so they can maximize um, the hypertrophy effect. But when it comes to training general population and athletes, that's not necessarily the goal, right? We want them to have functional carryover, purposeful carryover to their everyday life. If they're playing pickup basketball or they're playing golf or they're playing with their kids, or you have a competitive athlete who has to compete um, on the field of play very dynamically in multiple planes at a really high level, you need to take those things into consideration. And you know, like you mentioned, again, through the whole program at being very comprehensive, doing things that are really dynamic and multiplanar in a warm-up where there's low load and less threat. Um, so there's not going to be an external load that the athlete has to worry about. So things like skipping forwards, backwards, sideways, things like ladder drills, things like multi-directional movement drills, um, pl uh, plyometrics that are going to be forward, backwards, sideways, and diagonal. So they can start to prepare the tissues and prepare the nervous system for the rigors and the demands of multiplanar movement in sport. And then as we move into the weight room, there, we're going to, narrow down the variability a little bit more because we don't want people twisting and turning and jumping with weights. That's, that's where functional training, I think it's a bad rap. I think that's where risk and reward start to outweigh each other. Um, and that we're not able to actually get the loads we want if people are, you know, hopping around in circles with a weight over their head. But it's important to understand as we enter the weight room, this is where unilateral training becomes so important to, um, because just the nature of being on one leg, make something a multiplanar exercises, even if the majority of the gross motion, the visual motion of exercise happens in the sagittal plane. Like if you watch someone do a single leg squat, they're just still going, you know, straight up and down. Um, you don't see a, a lot of rotation or side to side activity in the transverse and frontal plane, but just by standing on one leg in that offset nature, it demands to, to, to do that motion successfully that you rely on frontal plane musculature, your adductor, your glute med, your oblique, to maintain position of your pelvis and your femur to do that exercise correctly. And that's really what helps safeguard us against things like lower extremity injuries, ACL injuries, and things like that is the development of those multiplanar muscles under load in a weight. So 
I think that we can get some of the more dynamic multiplanar activities in the warm up and the movement prep. That's a great way to train someone's nervous system into trade um, at higher speeds with low loads. And then in the weight room, focusing on offset loading, whether it's one arm pressing, one arm pulling, or unilateral lower body exercises to start to prepare the athlete for the multiplanar uh, natures of sports with higher load and higher stress, but not the same risk that comes from uh, multiplanar dynamic movement that you might do in the first half of the program. And interesting, this made me think of something where a lot of times people would say in fat loss or, you know, uh, when you're doing some, uh, the, 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 do the, do the big compound movements. Like they re- it's important to make sure you get compound music movements. Cause they're like best bang for your buck where I feel like when we start to talk about this idea about functional training, those exercises like the single, uh, you know, like a single leg squat, for example, that's going to activate some of these other, you know, multiplanar mus- musculature will now, those are now the good bang for your buck exercises. Would you agree? Yeah, and if you think about, you know, uh, they always say that it's fat loss because there's uh, like lots of muscles working, uh, generally a huge impact on your heart rate when you're doing a heavy set of loaded squats or heavy set of deadlifts, right? But I always say like I was doing single leg squats yesterday with my heart rate monitor on and I did eight on each side and I had a vest and you said my heart rate was through the roof up on the my zone. And so like you still get a large compound training effect from doing unilateral exercises because there's such a stability demand and you're moving such a large load off one leg um you realize like you're lifting what 84 percent of your body weight if you're doing a single leg squat when you take the weight of your leg and your torso um so it's still a compound movement it's just one leg at a time um and so i find that there's a lot of value and carry over to people of body composition goals as well in those exercises Absolutely. Kev, give us then, I mean, an overview now of functional training anatomy, because if I, if I'm going to just go by history of this series of books, right? I think the first one was probably bodybuilding anatomy, maybe, or um, I forget, it was so long ago, right? The first guy that, that kind of came out with these things, but it, it just seemed like what he did was show an exercise, show you what, where, what muscles were activated during that exercise. And that was really it. But this book is much more than that. Give us an overview of the book. Yeah. So what we wanted to do was create a book for a coach that could under, that would help them understand why we build the program the way we do as a whole. And then the carryover of the, some of the core exercises that we tend to program to life into sports. So when you go through, we have an introductory section where we ex- essentially explain what does functional training mean, like we just previously discussed, um, and why is it important to have an understanding of anatomy with respect to movement as opposed to, you know, just gross anatomy on a table, and understanding planar movement, like how, why are there different demands on muscles when joints are in certain positions and we're moving through space, and then following that, taking you through our entire program from the mobility portion, to the movement prep, um, to power generation, to strength training, and, and taking you through those core exercises and saying, okay, this is why um, single leg hopping is an extremely valuable tool um, to you know, improve performance and also safeguard against injuries. And an explanation after each exercise, along with the anatomical demonstration, that tells you, you know, why from an anatomical and uh, neurological standpoint that these are valuable exercises in a program to improve performance or improve your everyday life and, and health. Yeah, I, I kind of I really like that that uh, the format that you have because you know again first page you're going to get like let's actually do it sixty page sixty five let's go over that Six, single leg hurdle hop since you mentioned kind of a single leg hop um, it'll give us an explanation of what muscles are involved. Um, and then you have the icons, the little kind of sport icons, and then you have the execution. Okay. Tell, it tells us what our muscles are involved. And then there's the functional focus. So give us, uh, let's go over one. I mean, I'll probably go over two. So let's go single leg hurdle hop. Talk to us about the single leg hurdle hop. Yeah. So like single leg hurdle hop, this is when I think about our program and people ask me like, what's the most valuable thing that you could, if you had to narrow it down to one, they always want to narrow it down to one exercise. And obviously, like we said, it's a recipe, not a menu. But if there was one 
that I think probably has the largest carryover. It's our single leg plyometrics because what we're essentially teaching our athletes to do is to rapidly produce power off of one leg. And then even more importantly, possibly it's rapidly decelerate and control deceleration of their body weight on landing. And you think about when people get hurt, um, they don't ever get hurt taking off. They get hurt when they're landing, the inability to control joint positions uh, when they're coming back down to the ground. And so the single leg hurdle hop, obviously extremely valuable for uh, rapid force development in the glutes and the hamstrings and in the calf musculature, as well as the quads. Um, but then from a eccentric standpoint, um, being able to break through the quadriceps and control your body in space with your obliques and your frontal plane muscles, like your glute knee and your adductor and center yourself over your leg upon landing, um, to prevent non-contact lower, lower body injuries. And so like in the book, uh, we actually give an explanation, uh, where we, if we, I was a coach, how I would teach somebody to do it, the cues that I would use, the, the points that I'd want to see going through the muscles, um, like I just mentioned that would be involved. And then that same explanation about why it's so important for, you know, an athlete or a gen pop client to be able to do these things to keep themselves healthy and to be able to perform at their best. Cool. And just go over uh, the functional focus that you have in the book. Tell everybody what picture you have and, and what you're showing. So just yeah. so they get an idea. Yeah. Yeah. So the, so in the functional focus section, I actually have a picture um, of a goalie that's going up to catch a ball in soccer and they're coming down in a single leg stance where, where they would have to stabilize and land on that one leg. And if, if I actually read the functional focus, it says, uh, the single leg hurdle hop is a unilateral focus, lower body power and deceleration drill. This drill is especially valuable to improve unilateral rate of force development for running and cutting and eccentric landing skills to reduce lower body non-contact injuries. And so in every section with every exercise, we pr provide an explanation with an accompanying anatomical illustration of an athlete in their sport, uh, almost replicating the exercise that is being done on the page before, um, showing how it carries over to their activities and with the same anatomy highlighted. So people can see visually how what you do in the gym is directly connected to the things um, that you're going to be doing out in the field of play or in life. I love it because I think we need that explanation or that visual. Nick Winkleman did an amazing job, as you know, in the language of coaching in the end of the book. I mean, they just show some amazing visuals to kind of really help you understand what he's talking about with the cueing and why it's so important. And I, I think this is very similar. And I want you to just go over one more just a, a, because I, I love – also that it's not, you know, you're, you are obviously are relating it to sport as well, but uh, do the kettlebell swing. I'm a golfer. So you use a golf example as that, but go over the whole kettlebell swing, why it's important, the execution, and then, um, and then the functional focus. Awesome. So kettlebell swing, and this is actually page 90 and 91 and 92. Um, so kettlebell swing, obviously, <laughs> a great lower body power exercise. This is actually the main lower body power exercise that we use for our general population clients. We're not going to do nearly as much things like hang cleans or heavy impact exercise with some of our adults, but kettlebell swing is uh, really accessible to the average person. Um, and it's fairly easy to teach. So um, it's a great exercise to develop um, the glute max, uh, hamstrings, posterior chain, erector spinae, and even the upper back uh, musculature to be able to pack the shoulders and like so for the picture i have ariel my wife um demonstrating you can see the anatomy drawn in uh through her posterior chain um with the execution teaching them you know step by step how to do uh, a kettlebell swing like all the cues from the, from the very beginning and then if i kind of go to the functional focus the picture i have is of a golfer uh perfect for you and so if i read through the functional focus it says the kettlebell swing is a powerful tool to develop explosive hip extension for sports like baseball, tennis, and golf. In all these rotary power sports, athletes are forced to rapidly rotate their pelvis from a position of anterior tilt to a position of posterior tilt before the point of impact in order to create powerful hip extension and translate more force from the lower body into the swinging motion. Training heavily loaded kettlebell swings can help you develop explosive power in your hips and pelvis resulting in a high level of rotational power. And so what a lot of people don't realize, if you look at a kettlebell swing, 
you might look at it and think, how does this help me be, be have more power in a rotational pattern? Because you don't see someone twisting back and forth with a cable or a band, which again might be what someone thinks when they hear functional training. But you have to understand the activities that happen in a sport. And um, if you've you know gone through some of the TPI work or understand what happens in a golf swing, is the pe- your athlete is going to start in a position of anterior tilt, and as they start to come to the point of impact, they're going to rapidly posterior tilt to extend their hip and transfer that power. Um, from the ground through their torso into their hands or into whatever the object, if it's golf, into the club and into the ball to create that power. And so the kettlebell swing is a great tool to teach that activity. And it carries over uh, to more explosive power in the golf swing. And that's a great way. When I talk to some of my clients in the groups, the guys who like to golf, the second I can start to speak golf to them and tell them how, Hey, if you really focus on doing the swing, well, it's going to increase uh, yardage on the drive. That tends to get their attention to perk up uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, that's one way to do it. You know, one objection that, you know, I've gotten or I've seen in the golf community to the kettlebell swing, and it's kind of why I picked it, by the way, is because uh, I want you to speak to this because, you, you know, it, there's a lot of this that can happen in a lot of different sports. And especially with a golfer, for example, there's a swing fall called early extension, which is basically – the end of the kettlebell swing. So it's basically your hips moving towards the ball. Some people might call it a hip thrust. That's the old name for it. Basically what they're saying, what some people will argue is, well, I don't want my golfer early extending and the swing is a replication of that. Jason Glass had a okay description or a solution to that. He would say what happens in the gym stays in the gym, but I don't really like that saying because then that means what I'm doing in the kettlebell swing, the power that I'm getting is only going to stay there and it's not going to transfer to the golf swing. But I think for me, I always like to say, listen, when they have a golf club in their hand, that's totally different. They don't have a golf club in their hand right now. So we're in the gym, we're becoming more athletic, we're getting stronger. That's all that's going to help us as well, but this is specifically going to help us because we need to work on that hip hinge. Talk to us about some of those, you know, objections that people might have, like, well, you don't want to do this in this sport. Yeah. And I mean, I would say them like, I'm not going to give them the, the cues to a kettlebell swing when they're up on the golf team. Um, they have a golf coach and a skill coach for that. What we're essentially doing is preparing the joints and the tissues for the amount of force production um, that's going to happen. And we're putting more horsepower, so to speak, into that athlete for it to carry over. And I think the key is, as strength and conditioning coaches and personal trainers, is don't try to be uh, golfish, right? Is that the term that Charlie Weingroff always liked to use? Don't try to replicate golf and replicate golf skills in the weight room. Because if anything else, one, it probably isn't going to be very effective. And two, it might have a negative effect um, because you're trying to replicate that same golf activity. What we're trying to do as strength and conditioning coaches with every sport is get, is improve all of the general quality, right? We work on improving all the general qualities, power production, uh, joint range of motion, strength, um, endurance, so that then they can take those general qualities to their sport coach, to their end goal activity, and apply them in the proper fashion with the proper cueing to that activity. Um, and as long as you don't try to turn a kettlebell swing into a golf swing or vice versa, then that carryover is going to be effective and the cueing is going to be effective. Um, and I think we always have to remember that we as strength coaches and personal trainers should be aiming to be, create great generalists. We create great generalists. You're going to affect, you're going to get great specialists if they have good coaching um, at that next level with their sport coach or with their skill coach. Absolutely. It's a team effort. You handle what you handle. Stay for the most part in your lane. It'd be nice to know what the other cars are doing, but stay in your lane for the most part. So that's a great <laughs> explanation. Kev, let's finish up with, I, I know for me, my book was different, but I, I learned a lot because I learned how, uh, certain things about how people uh, were so different for the same subject. Uh, what did you learn? Because did you learn like some things like, wow, I didn't realize that the through, you know, these were, these other muscles were being activated during this. Cause now that you're getting the whole, the whole picture in here, what were some things that you felt like you learned or the big takeaway that you learned from your book? You know what? The process of writing a book really teaches you a ton and you, nobody, you don't really realize what goes into it until you go through that process that takes, you know, in this case, almost two years uh, to come all the way to fruition um, because Although you might have 
like a, you think internally in your head, I have a really good understanding of my belief system. I have a really good understanding of my philosophy and, and, and my exercise programming and selection. But when you actually have to put it all out in paper in an orderly fashion and, a, an, a, 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 and put it out so other people can digest it and understand it, um, it really forces you to confirm your beliefs. Uh, research your beliefs again. Like I went back through a lot of the books and a lot of the resources um, that I learned from my whole life and reconfirmed all the things that I, you know, already thought I knew and had to question to make sure, you know, that I'm putting something out that you really believe in. And then, you know, having, you know, great editors, the people at Human Kinetics and, and Mary Kate Fight who really made my writing uh, digestible. Um, did an amazing job to help help me craft the message most effectively. You learn a lot. And so I, I told some, this to somebody the other day. I said, you know, even if you're not going to write a book, I think it's a really valuable exercise to take time to write down your beliefs and, and your system because it's going to make you very confident. In, and it's also you're going to learn, you know, okay, this is actually how I think a program should be built. These are actually the whys behind why I choose this exercise rather than just, you know, this is the way that we've always done it. Yeah. You can poke holes in your own system. That's, Oh, I, I forget. There was a couple guys that used to talk about that. I forgot coaches. I don't know if it was Berardi or some people like talking about just try to find Patrick Ward, try to find the holes in your system. Try to be, try to be the, the, you know, the uh, contrarian to your own, uh, to your own system. And obviously that'll help you evolve. So, but uh, this is a great book. For, you did a great job of this. And I think it's not only don't think this is for beginners because there is really uh, the way you structured it in the way there's the functional focus kind of throws a lot of uh, like a different light on some of the things that uh, can help us explain to also to our clients. So Kev, great job with this book. Thank you. Thank you very much. It means a lot uh, hearing that from you. And uh, thanks for coming on and talking all about it. Good luck. You sold out on Amazon already, but you can still get it at Human Kinetics, or you can get the uh, you can get the Kindle version. Um, uh, you can probably still get the limited edition, no forward Mike Boyle uh, forward on it. So, uh, Kev, thanks again for doing this. Yeah, and it's uh, it's actually just back stocked up on Amazon now. So if if that's your preference. You can go get it there, and yeah, and you might get the limited edition version, but I know they're printing uh, the updated version with the forward included now, so um, you, can, you can go out and get that still. So yeah, thanks a lot. It's a great opportunity to come in and talk about it on here. All right, that's going to do for episode 307 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Remember, you can try strengthcoach.com out for 30 days, just a buck. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs. As well as the best forum on the net, it's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. To access that offer, go to shrinkcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. Special thanks to Chris Parrier and the folks over at Perform Better. Remember, the app is live. Presentations from last year's virtual summer seminar series, as well as some of the earlier functional training summits. Don't forget the weekly webinar series they're doing. Lee Burton this week. Josh Hank and Jessica Bento coming up. Allie Gilbert, Emily Spickle, Gray Cook, Dan John, Vince Gabriel. So many more. Check it out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Kevin Carr for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength conditioning, performance enhancement, and functional training anatomy. Thanks to Nomaly helping build relationships through personalized communication so your members stay longer and pay longer. Don't forget, go to their website, nomaly.com, N-A-A-M-L-Y, Dot com. Check them out. Use the referral code, code Shrink Coach to get started on your free 30 day trial. Thanks to Adam and Tim and Train Heroic. Coach Boy and I both use Train Heroic to deliver all of our online training. Head over to trainheroic.com to start your free 14 day trial. Thanks to Jenny Rurick of Fit to Speak. Check her out at fit 2 speak.com. Thanks to Kevin Carr and Brandon Rurick. Check them out at Certified FSC. That's Certified Functional Strength Coach. CertifiedFSC.com. My name is Anthony Renna. You can check out the show notes at ContinueFit.com. That's going to do it for this episode. Thanks for listening, and I'll speak to you next time.